All right, guys, we're getting set up. I think Facebook is here, and maybe YouTube is on top now. All right, guys, I'm just getting in here for my live stream. <laughs> Been running around all over town today, so sorry about the sketchy sort of start here. I'm... Uh, man, hope everybody's doing well. I'm working on a new painting right here that I started this week. Uh, this will be headed to Denver for uh, a show I have with Fascination Gallery in uh, Cherry Creek in downtown Denver uh, over Labor Day weekend. It's kind of coinciding with their rescheduled Cherry Creek Art Festival. Um, so please, uh, if you're in the Denver area over Labor Day, Indeed, go check it out. I'll have a bunch of new work, plus new limited edition releases and all that stuff. So, I, and, yeah, I just wanted to make sure I got that little plug in here before I get started. So, um, this painting, uh, for some reason I wanted to, like, work this into, like, a yellowish painting, and Every time, like, I, my, my color palettes always seem to revolve around reds and greens. And the way that this has um, sort of evolved so far is that it's turned into a purple and green painting. And, and I'm, so I'm kind of using a, a, the two dominant pigments that I'm using are diox, was it dioxapine purple. Is that how you say that? Dioxane purple. Let me look at that real quick. Yeah, dioxazine purple and uh, ox chromium oxide green. And they kind of complement each other pretty nicely. And then I have some Indian yellow and some uh, some light red that I've been working in there to sort of take the purple from a warmer purple to a cooler purple. And then the, the, the green goes to the yellow and then mostly to the warm side. I I'm not really going to the cool side of green in this painting. So... Um, yeah, the palette is very muted and starting to come around now. So I think I'm going to work on some background stuff today. Uh, let me get my references here. Um, hold on a second. I've got everything is mixed up right now. All right. Where are we at? Dang it. I gotta find my reference. Just give me a second, guys. So I use reference for my paintings. Uh, I got a question regarding um, how I set that up and, and you know, whether I get you know, you set up models or I get pictures from magazines and how I go about setting that up. So there's there's a bunch of ways that I've done that and I do it differently. Um, I've done it different ways throughout, throughout my career. Like, and I find that the best way to approach it, so I, I do use references that I take myself and I set up the references by getting models to pose with wardrobe and props and I set up lighting and all of these things and generally those are based off sketchbook ideas or some sort of premise and um, when I'm doing that I, I like to use models that I've used friends, family, anybody I can rope into it, it, it at one point like when I first started out I would meet people on the beach and I was painting mostly um, paintings of, with women in it and uh, I would find models in the beach, people who wanted to pose for paintings. And so that's how I would find the models. And then I would uh, set up a, some sort of wardrobe, but usually I would rely on the models to supply some of it because I just, you know, when I was starting out, I didn't have any budget. So starting out, I did what I could. And I would, I remember when I first started out, I used a disposable camera that you could get and it takes like 12 pictures and you drop the whole thing off and, and it gets developed and then you get your, 
photos. And the problem with that is the focal length was fixed. It was a flash and you, you got really bad references. Um, one of, the, one of the first things I did to get over that was I invested in getting a, a decent 35 millimeter camera. And um, that allowed me to, to focus, uh, change aperture, change focal length, all kinds of things that would make the um, paintings more usable. Um, or make the, make the references more usable, rather. So, the, the, I guess the point of what I'm getting at is um, there's a couple of things when you want to think about with references. First, the, the better your references, the more information you have. But the, the other side of that is that you don't want to be sitting around copying photographs and making your paintings look like your photos that you've taken. Otherwise, why not just use the photos? Um, and that's still something that's hard to do. It's hard to not get sort of mesmerized by the by the reference. And usually I find myself getting caught up in that when um, when I am trying to control the painting too much. Um, so there's a certain amount of I, I, you you want to use the the references as some as a reference, not as something that's dictating to you what the painting should or shouldn't be doing. And uh, so that's that's the struggle with references. So um, the other th the other thing is too that you might do that if your idea is based on the reference. So if you like, you know, like when I was starting, when I was a kid, I would paint these. Uh, draw. I would paint. I was drawing at that point. I draw. Um, I'm going to change my view on the on the live stream here. So you guys can see what I'm doing a little bit better. All right, so let's do that. So I have two angles here, so you can see what I'm doing larger, and you see what I'm doing kind of tied up into the into the. Uh, I'm going to raise the painting up a little bit. I'm going to have to counterweight this a little differently. All right, crap. All right. So, so I would draw like these um, weird-looking muscle guys and monsters with muscles, and so what I'd, I'd start this drawing a sketchbook, and I would get stuck because I wouldn't know what the muscles, and I was really interested in like, like muscly characters that had like veins popping out. And so what I would do is I would, when I would go to the grocery store with my mom or whatever, I would uh, find a bodybuilder magazines. And I would look and scour through them for to find photos that were kind of similar, like had had poses of people in similar positions to what I had in my my sketch that was going on. And I would tr try to, you know, if I had some allowance money or I'd buy them, or if not, I would try to convince, like uh, my mom or whoever. Like when I was on vacation with my visiting my aunt and uncle, I would try to convince them to buy me the. Um, magazine so I could use use those photos for references of how to make those muscles look correct. Hmm. And um, so that's how I started using references and I, and that and that I find that even still today that that's really the proper way to do it. Um, you you want to like I found that I've had the best results when I get something started, and then I go and try to source references for it. Um, well, it's not always the best results, but I, I typically don't become a slave to the reference when that happens. I'm using the reference as a tool rather than the tool dictating to me how something should appear in a painting. And um, the other the other thing is is that um, you know like so there's been instances where I can't really do that like I did a painting a w number of years ago of um, 
General Custer's Last Stand. And it was like this real historic, you know, a lot of historical things in it, as far as like uh, the cavalry uniforms, the Native American uh, uh, wardrobes and props, like weapons and stuff. And so, um, I kind of had to gather all of this information in advance before I um, started working on the painting. I mean, what happened is I did some, I started that painting and then I had to set the painting to the side for quite a while until I could figure out how to set, it, set up all the other stuff properly. It's like how I was going to compose the characters in, on top of like getting all the historical things correct. And living in LA, I've discovered a couple of things that really helped me to, to get like, especially with all the historical like wardrobes that I use in my paintings like I don't really want to have a a closet full of like petticoats and other other things I don't I don't need to have a a fashion store in my studio so I found a a place called Western Costumes that is a wardrobe studio and they rent out a wardrobe for movies and film and, and all that kind of stuff and and I was able to go there and start um Get the get the wardrobe that was correct for the period, and and they, a lot of times they had somebody that was working there that was really familiar with like, you know, wardrobe from the 1870s, and you, you know what certain people wore and what class of people wore what, and it was a, it was a really good resource. Um, I say it was like in past tense because I haven't been able to go there for quite a while, and so that's how I was able to start getting the the proper. Um, you know, like trench, like the uh, dusters and all that kind of stuff, and you know, like any sort of obscure. I did a painting of a Jeremiah Johnson, and I've got this huge fur coat that was made out of like buffalo hide or something. Like I couldn't afford ever to buy something like that, but for a few hundred dollars, I could rent it. And so I would start. I started renting uh, costumes and wardrobe, and then right around the corner from that place was a was a shop called History for Hire which I was able to go rent um, any other props that I might need. Uh, one time I rented a, a, a BAR, which is the kind of rifle that um, Bonnie and Clyde used. And I had to actually I had to get a million dollar insurance policy before I could rent it, just in case I used it to fake hold up a store or something. <laughs> but um, those are the resources that I used to, to uh, to sort of get the, you know, what, I, what I'm aiming for in the paintings is to have some sort of basis in reality, some, something that looks like it was really the, like accurate as far as the history or, or um, historical reference. And mainly the reason I like to do that is because there's always somebody that knows everything about whatever year it is that is you're painting. And if you have little technical flaws or misrepresentations, they, they love to poke their finger in your eye. Well, I, maybe not that they love to, but. I wanted to avoid that. I wanted it so that even people who were, you know, aficionados of like say uh, black powder pistols and Colt revolvers, that when they came in, they would be able to identify what revolvers they were. They weren't just some sort of um, cartoon version of everything. Even even though I tend to um, exaggerate and distort things quite a bit in my paintings. So. Like I, I like things to have a twisted feel to it, but I don't want them to be like too com too comical, if I can help it. And then the other side of that too is that you know you start to learn all kinds of things about whatever it is you're painting. Like you know, like I might have an interest in a subject, and that might evolve into you know a deeper understanding of something. You know, even just on you know, in terms of like what kind of clothes people wore a hundred years ago. Uh, the, the next sort of evolution in, in setting up my references for the paintings was that I was hanging out at a theater company here in LA called the Sacred Fools Theater and became friends with a lot of the actors and actresses and I started using some of them as models. I did poster art for some of their plays and I was start using them as models 
And the great thing about that, you know, is that um, one of the, well, so one of the goals of making these paintings is that they don't look like people were posing for paintings. I want there to be like, a, it looks like people are in the middle of something, there's some sort of um, emotion going on. And so the actors and actresses would be good at, at getting that flavor across it because they know how to, they know how to act. And so they, I, the way I would set, set that up is I would, um, I have, you know, I'd have my sketches and I'd have a premise, but if I found that if I tried to really, you know, the first, I, you know, when I was first doing a lot of this, I would try to make sure that my references were really holding true to my sketches and I would take little references for hands and like always position and really control the way that the references were, were working with for, for the painting. But I remember one time I was doing a painting of a girl holding a flower and I wanted it to be a certain way, but the the girl who was posing was was like a professional dancer too. She like I think she did like like Indian belly dancing or something. I don't know, but um, she held this flower petal in a real peculiar not peculiar but really specific way. That was just her way of doing it, and that's what I ended up using in the painting. And I I kind of discovered that. Um, getting people to pose for you in a way that is natural, like that's letting them do things that are natural is re really the best way to go. It helps, it, it adds to the flavor of the painting reference in the sense that some, you're, you're capturing something that's real and somebody's mannerisms instead of your, you forcing your um, perspective on it or your, whatever it is, like your, um, in, intentions. So I started sort of relaxing how I approached having models post with paintings where I would set up a premise, I would give them a loose set of instructions and I would have them have them sort of act out certain things. Like if I was doing a painting of people at a card table, I'd have them play cards and, and sort of role play, and especially with actors, I would just give them some, I could give them some premise and that they would take off with it and then it be, becomes more fun for them uh, they're part of the creative process in that in that sense and then I ended up getting better results than I could have planned to get if I had been trying to do it with intention and the things that I did sort of sort of sort of maintain the uh, control over was just the the wardrobe Propping tech, you know, like the technology, whatever is used, like if it's just pistols or different different things in the in the painting, that would be what I would try to make, make sure I had uh, some sort of control over. But even then, I would um, be consulting people at the wardrobe studio about like what would be more realistic in in that time period, for you know, whatever it happened to be. Uh, and, those, and those sort of things. All right, let me fix this view here. I think you're gonna be able to see what I'm doing. I need to raise this painting up. Now you can see what I'm doing. All right. trying to like pay attention to five things at once here is kind of difficult. <laughs> so, uh, so this whole discussion kind of stemmed from a question I got in a comment on a YouTube video, but the comment was deleted or I haven't been able to view it on the, on the YouTube uh, video, but I, I got an email with the question. That when YouTube sends an email when you get a comment, so I was able to see it. So that's where this que this question about like setting up references and stuff like that stuff comes from. Like I I don't generally show a lot of my references to people like, as a, you know, for for paintings. Like I, I don't want the focus to be on the reference. Like I don't 
think that's really that important. Um, some sometimes it'd be hard to tell that I was what reference I was using. When I, I get more specific with it, I some paintings more true to the reference than others. But that's kind of like one one little thing I like to keep. I don't know, not really shrouded in mystery, but you know, you, you don't want to show everything that you're doing all the time. <clears throat> so, like for this painting, I I've actually used these models for uh, several paintings, and so when I'm doing a setup for for one particular painting, I might have several scenarios that are set up so I can get sort of as much out of each each session of um, modeling. So I have the models pose, I have them maybe change in and out of different types of wardrobe. They'll go to the wardrobe studio and and uh, I'll make sure the clothes fit them. And sometimes like for you know some situations I might have the models involved with like what kind of wardrobe to pick out. Like I kind of like people to be involved with the project to add, it takes uh, like they like, especially like with the girls with the with the kind of wardrobe they're wearing, um, they might pick something better that's more suited than I would pick out because I'm not a girl, and so like I don't know what looks good. Like, but you know, like so, I'll rely on some of some of their their taste too. This is kind of cool. But at some point with the reference, you got to set your reference aside and work on the painting because ultimately you're not copying a photograph. You're you're creating um, your image making, and, and so you've got to have a. The, the the key with the reference is to sort of get as much information as you can to inform you about what you're going to do in the painting, and then using as little of it as possible so that you're only using as much as absolutely necessary. To, con to convey the feeling or the mood of the painting or the story that you're telling, if you're telling stories through the painting anyway. So, I kind of like leaving that a little bit open ended right there. So, I'm going to work on this gun a little bit, I think. Like, I want some smoke coming off of it. So I'm going to um, change up this again. All right. Well. I still haven't figured out how to view comments on this, so if anybody's leaving comments, I'll have to get back to you after after the uh, stream. So I think I want to bring some sort of color in here up a bit, and I'm not sure. I think I'm going to use a little bit of this sort of purple and green mixture. I'm going to bring it into this over here. Let's, we can, you know, since the underlying layer is already dry, I can sort of test it out. If it doesn't work, I can then um, just paint, wipe it off or something if I want to. Gives me a little bit of flexibility. It's one of the things I like about oil painting versus acrylic is that I have a little more forgiveness in how things work. Like acrylic pigments dry very quickly. I, I, you know, you can, there's ways to get around that, but. Ultimately, oh, I think oil paints work better in this instance for changing your mind. <laughs> and I tend to change my mind a lot in paintings. Like, there's times when I'm working on a painting that um, I might have an idea of how how something started, then it completely changes. I think I know what I'm going to do. So I'm putting a a layer of like medium of liquid and lidseed oil on this and then I'm going to glaze a color over the top of it 
and then I'm going to wipe out the smoke rolling off the pistol here so that the background shows through and it'll be like kind of a reverse thing. So let's see if that works. You don't want to get really heavy handed with your mediums though because they do tend to dry in a more yellowish tone. So be thin with it, sparing with it if you can. Okay, let's see. I think I need to zoom out. I'm gonna focus it a bit better. Maybe this will help you see what I'm doing. Actually, you can see what I'm doing on this. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> Transition again here. All right. Let's see if that works better. All right. So let's see if I can screw this up. So I'm going to knock down this purple, though, with a little bit of uh, Indian yellow. It's going to sort of... I'm not sure how I like that. I don't think that works very well. I think I want it a little bit lighter. So I think it needs to be kind of a grayer tone. And uh, let me see what I can scrounge up here. So I'm going to mix a little bit of like this Portland gray medium in here. That's more what I'm going after, I think. I do like that. That somewhat looks better. Uh, oh, there we go. Bring it down so I can reach it. All right, I need a brush to kind of blend those. I'm holding that brush. The other thing I've been kind of thinking about this week too is that I, I'm pretty rough with my brushes. Like, and there's sometimes you get a brush that's just kind of beat up and it has a certain character to it that really you can't get with a new brush. But I find that there's some there's some things that require that you just have a a clean, nice brush, and so I've kind of been toying around the idea of um, really focusing on what I'm doing with my brushes a little bit better. Like I don't always pay that close attention to it. I just pick up one and I find one that works, and and uh, that kind of what brought that about this week is that I got bunch of new brushes and then I was working on these faces and I was struggling to get it to look right and then I found one of these new brushes that I bought and it just made my life so much easier having the right the right brush the right tool to do it with so there are some instances where I think I will probably use newer brushes for certain parts of certain parts of certain paintings. 
So now this whole area down here is looking a little, if you see where I'm painting, uh, the bottom part is looking a little bit too, too green. Um, I think I'm going to make that a lot warmer, like really warm. I think that will look really nice. So it, I think it will. And I'm working towards how to make this smoke. I have smoke coming off this gun somehow. So I'm working on trying to figure out how. And I want to do it as a wipeout. I think that's going to be really cool. So let's. And these are the sort of decisions that your reference can't really help you with. Like, one of the things I don't really copy or pay a lot of attention to in my references is the, um, the color that's in the photos. I like to really kind of go out on a limb and do different things. And if you're paying too much attention to your reference, you can, that can get in the way of doing something more interesting color-wise and almost anything else. So, yeah, that looks nice. I'm going to kind of blend that together. So, hey, at least I got my audio on this week, huh? <laughs> All right, so I'm going to take some more of this. I was using this dioxin purple and this light red color. I don't have a camera on my palette today. I thought I would show like kind of a wider and a closer view of the painting instead. I hope people are enjoying that. I really like this color. It's So this is a really light layer that's over, um, it's sort of a translucent layer. So it's not necessarily, I'm not using necessarily transparent pigments. So I'm just using the, the mediums as a way of um, lightly laying in a tone. And so you're seeing this yellowish color bleed through in places. I think that's looking pretty decent. I mean, as far as the color goes, I got some. So I'm gonna not worry about getting it on over that gun because I'm gonna just wipe it off of that gun in a second here. So, like going back to the reference idea, the the, the if, if you're an artist and you're trying to figure out how to set this up. Um, the the key the goal I think is to not uh, be set up you start getting dictated what to do by your reference like you know like that it isn't as important as you think it is like it's I I find that I use reference better when I spend more time working from life or imagination and then you come back to the reference as something you just refer to when you're stuck instead of something that you're copying. Like, if you don't know how something looks, then you go look it up. Do I like that over the gun? I kind of like that over the gun. It makes it feel like there's a shadow or something coming over this. You know, I've also I've often, often thought that uh, everything you really need to know about painting, you can kind of learn from Bob Ross. <laughs> he doesn't really explain what he's doing, but the principles of what he's doing, if you follow along, are everything you really need to know about making paintings. So if like you really want to learn how to paint, just follow along with Bob Ross for a while. I mean, he'll tell you what colors to use, but he won't tell you why those colors matter. Versus like, you know, if you're using a, 
Van Dyke brown, which I've never used, but I know that he uses that a lot in his paints, versus like a raw umber or a burnt umber. There's reasons for everything he does, but if you're just wanting to make stuff and you don't need to know all the all the reasons why, I guess, I guess that's his reasoning. Okay. So I don't know if it's showing up on a live stream, but the problem with this right now is that I have all of these sort of brush strokes that are in the painting that I don't like. So I got to get a soft brush, which is like the soft round brush is a Da Vinci brush, which is really good for softening edges and stuff, making soft uh, brush strokes. I got a bigger brush, a bigger Da Vinci brush. It's a black sable. I love these brushes. They're pretty expensive, but it makes paint work like butter. It's like putting frosting on a canvas rather than paint. It's, I highly recommend. I remember when I discovered them, I was like, like one of these brushes was like 60 bucks. I'm like, man, 60. I want to see what a $60 brush does. And <laughs> I was quite impressed. They're, they're worth it. Now, so the, like what I'm doing at this stage of the painting is I'm kind of trying to tie everything together. Like it's all in the same environment. So like before I had sort of the background was really separate from the foreground. And I don't really, I want it to look like it's all living in the same place. The atmosphere is blending itself together. So this brush works pretty good. I just talked about these expensive brushes. I'm getting hairs on my brush, and the brush in the paint. I don't want. All right. Forget that for a second. I'm just going to work this in and out. I'm going to raise this up a bit so I can see what I'm doing. I'm just trying to smooth this layer up a bit without showing the brush strokes or the, like where the brush strokes end and stop. So it might take a little bit of working back and forth to sort of figure out where that works. But that really killed the acidity of that yellowish green color. Which the best way I can describe it. it was like kind of like acid, some sort of acid, like toxic waste or something, or like like if you ever watched Rick and Morty, that episode where they <laughs> have the vat of acid, is that kind of color. And there's enough of the yellow showing through that it sort of feels warm and like light, so that's good. I really like that going over the gun too. It really sort of blends in nicely. But like I said, I want to sort of wipe out where the smoke's going to roll off here. So the smoke's going to roll off this pistol and go up and then it's going to Maybe be some smoke coming off the shotgun up here. Uh, let me think for a second. Um, where are my rags? <laughs> I have, oh, there they are. Okay. I'm going to see if this works very well.
don't like that. I, mean, I don't. I like the way it works, but I don't like the shape. So I'm going to just blend it back out. This is what I like about oil paints. I have yet to figure out how to do this with acrylics, this sort of thing. If anybody does know how, please let me know. Still don't like it. So let's start from pistol instead, see if that makes a difference. I just... Oh, maybe. Don't like that either. Let's smooth that out. Actually, I wonder if it looks better just sort of peeking out around the, on the edge of the pistol. Coming out around here. It's kind of cool. Like, why am I getting hair right here? Yeah, brush hairs in the painting. I don't want those in there. Oh, I forgot to mention, I had some cool news. The books that I put out um, that the Kickstarter for in 2019 have um, they won a publishing award. So the publishers of the book submitted it to uh, some sort of awards competition, and they won Best Picture Books uh, by Four Color Printing. I can't, there's some organization, I can't remember the top of them. I, had, I, just, I just got the message yesterday, but I... When I know more about it, I'll post more about it. That was pretty cool. <laughs> so what if I have this? Winding up around it. Oh, 
That looks more interesting. I can dig that. I think I want that to go in front. Just like this. So. That looks pretty cool. I'm going to take some of this just to wipe out a little bit of the highlights on the pistol, I think. Cool. I like it. It's all right. Bring it down. That sort of ties the figures that in a bit better. So this looks this looks looking a lot better. Going to um. Do some of the top part of this painting. See if I have a better. There we go. I'm not gonna mess with that. That takes a little. That camera takes a little more finessing. So I'm gonna take some of this color. I'm just gonna like do the same thing up here. Just kind of like lightly scumble it on. Just gonna shift the tone of that color a little bit. I want all this texture and and uh, streaks and runs and drips to shine through it. To kind of, kind of, I guess, vignette the characters and do the same thing on the other side. Sort of really lightly. And this hour is blown by pretty quick, eh? So like again, I mentioned the beginning of the stream, if you're in Denver over the Labor Day weekend, I will be there live. I'll actually be doing a portrait demos. And what I do for those is I pick people from the audience and usually there's like a, you get a raffle ticket or something. I draw a number or a name out of a hat and whoever gets picked gets to post for the painting. It's usually about an hour long demo and the winner gets to keep the painting. So um, the way I've done it in the past is, is uh, people who show up in wardrobe and costume get extra tickets to be in the, in the uh, drawing. So if you want a chance to win, win a painting of yourself by me, Going to one of these shows is a good opportunity for that, and usually a lot of fun. <laughs> I'll say usually <laughs> hasn't hasn't been in a sense where it wasn't really, but you know, knock on wood. All right.
I still got a lot of detail work and just sort of fine tuning tones and colors and structures and different things, but I I wanted to kind of tackle the broad stroke, like you know, get some of these um overall the overall feeling color structure of the painting nailed down a little bit better. I think I'm there. And uh, I think with that, I'm going to close up a little early today. I got some other things I got to get done in the studio before I'm done for the day. And like I said, I've got a lot of deadlines. I got a shipping deadlines and, and order deadlines for uh, my show coming up. And if, you, if you can't make the Denver one, I have shows, a book signing coming up in Austin, middle of September. I uh, can't remember the date off the top of my head. I'll let you guys know about that more later. And then uh, another show with Distinction Gallery in Escondido in uh, the second Saturday of October. And I'll have a bunch of new paintings for that one, too. So, all right, with that, I'm going to bid you a farewell. And I hope you have fun working on your own paintings or any other artwork that you're creating. And if you have questions about uh, the process or anything like that. You know, if you're an artist wanting to ask another artist questions who I've been, been doing this for 20 years, uh, feel free to shoot me a message and I will try to address them in future streams. So, all right. Guess that's it for now. See you guys later.